So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah. All right. Anyway, I want to talk about this fellow here. This is Dr. Jordan B. Cooper. And that's the name of his YouTube channel. Dr. Abbreviated Jordan B. Cooper. And uh, this fella is a Lutheran. He from the few videos I watched of him, I, I put together that he was uh, a Calvinist, and then he became a, a Lutheran, and he has some videos I've been checking out about why he's not a Roman Catholic, why he's not Orthodox, why he's not Reformed, and I find him very interesting, and he seems like a genuine guy, uh, but uh, he had a video about five reasons why he doesn't believe in the rapture. Let me close this thing out. I didn't realize I had that paint window up. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I checked out his video. It was only about 16 minutes long. Uh, I ended up writing down six points, and there's sub points that I want to talk about in this video about his video. Uh, but before I do that, there is a side subject I wanted to bring up because it, it kind of ties into this. Because he's a Lutheran, so he believes that the bread and wine that you have in communion to remember what Jesus did for you, what he literally did, is actually literally the body and blood of Jesus. Now, this doesn't make sense if you believe the gospel, because... The gospel is about being saved by grace through faith, through what Jesus did at the cross, and that's that, right? Like the thief on the cross, as I put in the beginning of my videos, he didn't partake of the communion, he didn't get water baptized, any of that. He just believed, and he believed on Jesus and what he was doing there on the cross, as he says, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom, showing that he believed Jesus was going to raise from the dead. Just like Abraham believed Isaac was going to raise from the dead. And uh, if you believe that, it kind of contradicts the belief that the bread and wine is literally the body and blood of Jesus. Because that would mean, as Jesus says, if you want eternal life, you have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Now, if that's literally that bread and wine, then you have to go to your church and you have to have those priests turn it into the literal body of blood of Jesus. And if you don't eat and drink it, you don't have eternal life. That contradicts the gospel. And the understanding of John chapter 6, where Jesus wasn't talking about bread and wine when he said to eat his flesh and drink his blood. He tells them by verse 63, my words, the flesh profits nothing. It's my words that are spirit in our life. Because that's what leads to the new birth, as we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. That word is the uncorruptible seed of God, the gospel, about what Jesus Christ did for us. And when we believe that, that's partaking of the flesh and blood of Jesus. And it's spiritual food, not physical food. Uh, so that contradicts. And what does this have to do with this video about the rapture? Well, it's weird that there's people who believe in the gospel about how we're saved by God's grace and his mercy at the cross. And they believe it, like this fellow seems to believe it. But then they'll say that, oh, we're going to have to go through the end where God pours out his wrath, even though Jesus took on his wrath, 
upon God's wrath for us. And during this time, there's a new gospel preached. Well, I shouldn't say a new gospel. I should say a different gospel, not the gospel of grace. And if you take the mark of the beast, you're damned. So you're not saved by grace through faith. You're saved by faith and works, right? It's a complete opposite. Well, I shouldn't say complete opposite because it still has faith, but you also need the works. Uh, an example, I have Revelation 14 here to show this. In Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, it says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth in the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, this gospel is about worshiping God, the Creator, right? This is not the gospel given to the church, the gospel of grace, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. The gospel plainly put to us about how Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. This has nothing to do with Jesus and him dying for you and raising from the dead. This is a different gospel, right? But that's because. There was a rapture, and that's what I want to talk about with this guy's video. Now, his first point, he doesn't make it actually a point, but he says it quite a bit, where he talks about the secret coming of Jesus, like the rapture is a secret, and it's actually the coming of Jesus. That is a straw man argument, uh, and I only hear people who don't believe in the rapture call the rapture secret. And the coming of Jesus. People who believe in the rapture do not call it a secret and don't call it the coming of Jesus. So uh, that's a straw man argument right there. It's only the people who don't believe it who call that and they usually say that mocking it. Because how is it a secret if we know it and we're telling it to you and the whole world knows about this is supposedly the rapture. So even if they don't believe it, they know about it. So when it happens, they know what happened. It's not a secret what happened. So to call it a secret is not a teaching that people who believe in the rapture actually call it, right? And they, they, nobody says it's the coming of Jesus. I never taught that. And I don't know anybody who believes the rapture who calls the rapture the coming of Jesus. No, it's us being caught up to the clouds to him, right? And then when he returns, he returns with us, with his armies, and he lands on the Mount of Olives. That's his actual coming, the, the day of the Lord, as this fellow actually talks about. Where he, he's able to understand that the day of the Lord is when Jesus returns. No one says that the rapture is the day of the Lord. And he brings up First and Second Thessalonians. Well, I think he brings up First Thessalonians, but he, he doesn't get into the Second Thessalonians. In my note, I wrote it down because there's a connection there that uh, he misses. And uh, I'll jump to that when I get to that. So his, his first point, which he doesn't call his first point, is this secret coming of Jesus. This is not true, right? If it's a secret, how are we, do we know about this and how are we talking about it? And we don't say it's when Jesus returns. No, it's before he returns, right? Um, but anyway, uh, he does talk about how like in the movies it shows all like your clothes that's behind and all this and what have you. And, you know, we're basing this off of the Bible, not movies. We, like the rapture, I'm not sure exactly what happens. I don't know if our body disintegrates. I don't know if it drops dead. I don't know if just the blood pours out because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, I don't know exactly what happens. If we go up and we're changed in the middle of the, in the, of the sky, I don't know how it is. Maybe it's just like... The, the movie or TV shows they make about it. I don't know. But that's not a doctrine. It doesn't quite say in the scriptures. You can put things together and kind of speculate, but you're not going to be able to really put it together. At least I don't think. Uh, another side point he brought up was about his church tradition. And he says a lot of things that makes him sound Roman Catholic. I know he's not Roman Catholic, but Lutheranism is like the first step from leaving Roman Catholicism, right? And it seems like he hasn't taken that step to get completely away. 
from going from Calvinism to Lutheranism, it's like he's taken a step to the Roman Catholic Church. Not that Calvinism is true, but I see Calvinism as part of the Roman Catholic's counter-reformation to counter things like Lutheranism, where people were leaving the Roman Catholic Church, but they didn't quite leave everything. And then as the Protestants grew in their knowledge of God and their scripture, they started drifting further and further away from Roman Catholicism, such as getting away from the Eucharist and believing it's literally the body and blood of Jesus, for example. They, they got away from all that, but he seems to have diverted backwards, going back to the Roman Catholic Church by becoming Lutheran. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so when he brings up this point saying his church tradition, it's like, so, so what? Traditions are traditions. They might be true, they might not be. There might be some truth into them, there might be no truth to it. What we do know is that the scriptures are inspired and they're perfect. We don't have to worry about, oh, some of it might be true, some of it might not be, we have to flip a coin or something. No. We actually can take the scriptures and then we can test the traditions to the scriptures, right? Just like we would go to the Roman Catholicism and test their traditions to the scriptures and go, oh, that doesn't line up, right? Something uh, real quick as an example would be Mary. The Roman Catholic Church tradition says that Mary is a perpetual sinless virgin. But in the scriptures, we're told clearly that she marries Joseph and is his wife. So she has to perform the wifely duties or else she is sinning. And then she even refers to God as her savior, showing again that she's a sinner. And then she offers up two turtle doves according to the law of Leviticus 12. One turtle dove for a burn offering, the other one for a sin offering, again showing she's a sinner. And then we read about Jesus' brothers and sisters, where it actually names, I believe, four of his brothers in one of the Gospels. I just remember Joseph and James are the only ones I can remember. I think there might have been a Judah or Judas as one of his brothers, too. But don't quote me on that third one there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so she's not a perpetual sinless virgin. The tradition says she is, but the tradition is wrong because it doesn't agree with God. And that that's that simple, right? So when he brings up the tradition, I thought that was just strange because it's like, well, you sound a lot like Roman Catholics, just like the Calvinists. They sound kind of Roman Catholic when they say, well, the reformers didn't believe and teach this. And it would be like, so are they the standard? Are they inspired? Do we test everything to the reformers or to the scriptures? And Because, you know, that's what the Roman Catholics would do. They'd be like, oh, well, the early church fathers didn't believe this. What does it matter? Did the word of God teach it? Did Jesus teach it? Did the apostles? Because if we see that in the scriptures, it doesn't matter what they believed in taught. But for some reason, they use that as their standard. This is a little weird. So, this actually ties into his first point. I have it as point two. He says, it's not historical teaching, right? The church didn't historically teach the rapture. Even though you can find recently, as they've been translating some ancient Greek sermons that were written down, they were actually talking about the rapture. It's kind of interesting. Something you can look up on your own. I'm not going to actually get into it because we don't need history to prove the rapture, right? We got the scriptures. God says it. Who cares what man says, right? Who cares what man believes? Right? If they don't line up with God, screw them, right? So he says it's not historical teaching. And I thought that was kind of funny because we look at Israel as a nation, right? They didn't have a historical teaching of the Messiah coming to die for your sins, to be crucified of Gentiles. But the Bible actually taught it. Right? When you actually go back and look at the Old Testament, you see that, like Isaiah 53, about being pierced. About how the Lord says, they'll look upon me whom they have pierced. Right? And you know about all of the sacrifices we're pointing to how god is the innocent one in all of this but he takes on all the sin right it was there all along but it wasn't historical teaching of israel so in like manner just because it's not a historical teaching of the church 
that doesn't mean it's not true. I mean, you can use that to say, okay, that's why I don't believe, but then back then you could have said, well, historical teaching of the Messiah dying for sins, they didn't have that, so I don't believe it. Okay, well, then you don't believe the scriptures. You're following a church, not God, right? You're getting your wires crossed up and mixed. And he brings up Darby, that Darby is the one that uh, started this in like the 19th century, in the 1800s there. And I, I think it's funny, whenever I talk about the rapture, a lot of times people bring up how Darby started it. And for the longest time, I didn't really know much about Darby. And I, at first, didn't believe the, about the pre-tribulation or pre-time of Jacob's trouble rapture when I first became Christian, was starting to follow Jesus. I didn't believe in it. But then over years of just reading the scriptures, it started to unfold and I started to see it. And then the people started saying, oh, you're, you're just following Darby and that's not an actual teaching of the church. And he's like, well, I'm showing this in the Bible. And I have a playlist of many times that I've explained the rapture in the scriptures. Right? And I, I break it down very thoroughly. So you can check out my playlist. But I, I will either have it entitled Rapture, Pre-Tribulation Rapture, or something along those lines. If you just put Rapture uh, on my channel, on the uh, main page of my channel there, it should come up with the playlist or what have you. I don't think I have too many of them. Maybe like 10 or so. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. But uh, I, I think it's funny that he brought up with Darby that he said maybe all of Christianity got it wrong until Darby and, you know, Darby finally could see it and got it right and what have you. And the funny thing about it is that's exactly his point of view, isn't it? The Roman Catholic Church had it wrong this whole time. And then all of a sudden someone like Luther opens up the scriptures and sees, hey, we're saved by grace through faith without our works he sees that and then the church says well that's not a historical teaching well we got it wrong for all this time and now you finally got it right he's basically saying a roman catholic argument which is very silly and nonsensical since he believes that <laughs> when it comes to the gospel right so i thought i thought that was a bit strange that his first point it, it kind of refutes itself Right? It's inconsistent. Because when it comes to Israel not having a historical teaching, well, well, that doesn't matter. The scriptures teach it. Well, did the whole Christianity get it wrong up until this point? Well, you believe that about the gospel, right? So when, when it comes to a, a, a one point of view of somebody else saying, oh, it wasn't historical teaching and they got it wrong, then yes, that's true. But when it comes to me, it's not true. So you could see that it's not a consistent argument. It's not a solid foundation because it's inconsistent. Like if you're standing on it over here, you're wrong. But if you're standing on it here, you're right. Well, it's not consistent because if it could be wrong then, it can be wrong now. So it's not a solid foundation. It's not something you want to use to hold yourself up. So, uh, I... Just thought that was interesting. But one more point about Darby is that after, I would say, a couple of years of people bringing up Darby, I decided to look into what Darby taught about the rapture. And when he first, at least the first part I came to about his teaching, he used Revelation. And that's exactly where I go. And he focused on Revelation 4. And I was like, that's exactly the same conclusion I came to just reading through. Because that's where it actually hit me that the rapture happens and before the tribulation is because I was doing like I always do. Every now and then, I will just open up Revelation and read it through. Because, you know, you go on after thinking about it and life happens, weird things are going on. And maybe you learn new things over the past few months or year and you open up and you're like, I'm just going to read through. And maybe I'll see it differently. And I was doing that not trying to find anything. I just wanted to read through it. And then when I came to the Church of Philadelphia and the door being open to them and them escaping everything that's going to uh, 
come upon this world to tempt him, to tempt the whole world. And then John, the one body going up in Revelation 4. And I was like, yeah, he's the one person out of all the disciples who made it all the way to the cross. All the others fell away. He's the one body. He's the Christian, the true Christian. And him, go, him going up is grace going up because his actual name means like God's grace, grace of God. And, uh, and then that unfolds to all kinds of other stuff. Of course, I'm just scratching the surface here. I get into great detail in other videos about that and connect it to what Paul says, especially in uh, Revelation 4, where immediately John was in the spirit is the same thing where Paul says, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, you're changed. Where you leave this mortal body and you put on the immortal body. Leave the mortal body for the immortal. Hope I said that right. And he says that there's a physical body and a spiritual body in that same passage of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that is. So, uh, with that being said, let's go to his uh, second point, which I have for a third point. He says, 1 Thessalonians 4 says it's loud. There's a trumpet and all this. I was like, yes. Like I said, nobody who's actually preaching the rapture says that it's some quiet mystical thing. A lot of times we talk about that trumpet is just like what John was talking about when there was a voice that spoke about Jesus being his beloved son from the heavens. Well, some people said, hey, an angel spoke from heaven. Well, other people, what did they hear? A thunder. That's how it's going to be. The rapture is going to be this. Something happens. But people are going to hear it differently. They're either going to he actually hear God say something like, come up hither. Or they're going to hear the rumbling of a thunder or the sound of a trumpet. Right? Because as Paul puts it, or I should say John puts it, is he a voice as a trumpet. Right? So there's all this connection to there where some people would hear a trumpet, the other people would hear a voice. But it's actually the same thing. Um, but again, this connects to uh, where he brings up Thessalonians 4 about it being loud. There's, there's two points to bring up because he brings up the day of the Lord, but also something that he seems to overlook about 1 Thessalonians 4. And that is that Paul never warns about the church about having to deal with the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. He mentions him once in 2 Thessalonians 2, but he doesn't talk about having to deal with him, having to deal with his mark. And having to resist a mark of the beast. He never talks about any of those things with the church because we're taken before that happens. That's why in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, hey, don't think in that we've been gathered and that the day of the Lord is at hand. Because again, the rapture is not the day of the Lord. They thought they missed the rapture and that they were going to have to face the day of the Lord. So let's actually bring that up. I think it's better if you see it for yourself on this one here. 2 Thessalonians Go to chapter 2 here. Uh, right here. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, like he already brought up, that he was teaching about the rapture. He didn't say anything about any antichrists or what have you. But you see, these people are in fear because they thought they missed it. You know, maybe people were teaching, oh, Jesus already went up and he already took his people with him. Who knows how they were trying to say the rapture already happened. Maybe the people who raised up with Jesus actually were raptured too. Right? with Jesus. But anyway, uh, let's look at what it says here in 2 Thessalonians 2, in the first two verses here, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together with him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Why is he saying that? You see, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, is not at hand. You see, when the rapture happens, that's when you know the day of Christ is at hand, right? You look at Revelation chapter 4. Rapture, what's the next thing that happens? Revelation 6, the seals are opened. The time of Jacob's trouble has begun. That's why we have a different gospel in the Revelation. That's why you read about 144,000 Jews that are sealed. Because it's not about the church. The church, there is no Jew or Gentile. In it. You become a whole new creature, right? But in there, you, in Revelation 7, there's 144,000 Jews and a great multitude of Gentiles. It has them separated. 
because it's not the church, right? The church is gone. That's why the church is not mentioned. Any more after uh, Revelation 3, and I guess you could say it's mentioned in 4 and 5 in heaven, but after that it's not. Uh, but like we see here, they're troubled because they think the day of the Lord is at hand. What's the day of the Lord? Jesus returning. But what happens right before he returns? The man of sin, as Paul talks about, shows up. Right? He's saying, hey, don't worry. You're not going through this. All right? He already told them they are going to be raptured. Right? Didn't say that anything was going to happen before then. Like the sun being darkened and the moon not giving the light and... All the, uh, this, this man of sin is going to come and do all this, and then the rapture happens. No. What he goes on to talk about is what happens before Jesus returns. And he's saying, no, you're not, you're not going through that. That's why he says to comfort one another. How is it comforting to know you're going to go through hell and high water, and if you survive, uh, you'll get to see Jesus return and take you up to heaven? I mean, it's not super comforting at all. Yeah, I mean, the end part, comforting. But it's like, hey, uh, you're going to uh, be thrown into fire and be burned alive. Uh, but take comfort in that. Be like, oh, okay. Uh, but, you know, not every Christian has to do that to be saved, you know. I mean, you're not doing it to be saved, but you, you're going to go through it, but take comfort in it. It's like, okay, <laughs> I'll do my best, but I don't find it comforting to be thrown alive into fire knowing that I am going to suffer and burn before... Uh, Jesus comes and actually saves me from it. Or I just die in it, and he raises me to life. That's all good and dandy. You know, if that's God's will, that's God's will, but it's not comforting, right? Uh, so I think his second point, I did enough with that. Let's go to his, his third point, what I have here for my fourth point. He brings up Luke 17. And those taken and those left. So basically what he does here is he comes over here. He skips all the way down to where it says it's going to be like in the days of Noah, being like in the days of Lot. And he says the ones taken were the ones killed in the flood and those killed in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And those left were Noah and Lot. And I, okay, you know, at first that makes sense, right? But then when you actually think about it, that's not what's going on because you see how it says in the days of Noah. Well, what happened right before these days? Enoch was taken. You see, a lot of these people who don't believe in the rapture, they, they don't really talk too much about Enoch and him being taken. Again, one body, like one body of the church taken up before the flood. You see, Noah actually represents the 144,000 because he found God's gr grace by his genealogy, by his genetics, as we're told in Genesis 6. So it's just like the 144,000 Jews. They found grace because they have certain genetics, right? They're Jewish from a bloodline that God gave a promise to. That's very gracious, right? They didn't do anything to earn or deserve that. They just happened to be born in that family. And praise God. And they get protected through that. They get sealed. Because of that, because of the promise of God, because God is good, because he's great, merciful, and gracious, right? Not because they did anything special, right? And, uh, yeah, so that's what Noah seems to represent there, right? The, the actual 144,000 going through the tribulation there. And then with Lot, you have Lot taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah before it's destroyed. He seems to think that, oh, you know, Lot was left and they, the people burned up were taken. But that's not what happens. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah would represent the world. Lot was taken out by the angels. Then Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Right? And where was Lot told to go? To the mountains. Right? To go up. Elevate. So you see the story of Lot told go up to the mountains. That's where he was supposed to go. He didn't want to go there. Right? Because he was a worldly guy. Like a lot of Christians, they don't want to be taken. But they're going to go kicking and screaming if they're born again. But he didn't want to go up to that mountain. 
and uh, then when he's actually taken out of Sodom and Morah, it's destroyed. And then he was like, you know what, I should probably go up to that mountain. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, uh, let's actually take a look at this and what he brought up from, uh, I don't think he brought up Matthew, but what he said reminded me of Matthew. I think he brought up actually Mark, but I wanted to show that this is actually taught uh, because he made a point. The last point he was saying was that Jesus doesn't teach it. And I think that's a big misunderstanding because a lot of what Jesus said has nothing to do with the Christian church at all. Right? He's speaking to Jews under the law. So a, a lot of what he's teaching has nothing to do with us. Like Matthew, for example, he says twice there about how he sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He tells his disciples not to go out to the Samaritans who are half Jews or to the Gentiles who are not Jews at all, just to Israel, just to the Jews. Because that's what he was coming to do, right? To establish the kingdom of heaven, which is the physical kingdom of Israel, where he would reign as king in Jerusalem. But they rejected that, right? So a good chunk, matter of fact, it seems like the most, especially in the whole gospel of Matthew for the most part, uh, is directed to the Jews under the law, right? So you need to take those kind of things into consideration, into context, right? Like a lot of people like to take Hebrews and they say things out of Hebrews that don't make sense, not take into consideration that Paul is talking to Hebrews, to Jews under the law who are used to something like animal sacrifices for their sins. So when he's saying certain things, he's talking to a certain group of people in a way that they would understand. He's not talking to Gentiles, not under the law, right? So, yeah, the context and part of the context is who is being talked to, right? So anyway, uh, let's actually take a look at what it says here in Luke 17. We're going to start at verse 22. I think he started at verse 31 when he did it, but then he came back because he talked about one left, one taken, right? And he's saying, uh, where, Lord? He left out verse 37 where he's asked, where are they taken to, right? And he says, where the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So you see how he's saying, where are they going to be taken? Where are the eagles gathered when there's a body? In the sky, in the heavens, right? So you see, that's where they're taken to. He left that part out conveniently, right? And he also leaves out this part up here. Starting at verse 22, in Luke 17, it says, And he said on to the disciples, this is Jesus, he's the one saying on to them. He's the he here. The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as lightning that cometh out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So you see what he says here about how lightning goes from east to the west, like he says it in Matthew, right? One part of heaven to the other. Lightning is like, boom, just like that. You may see it. You may be like, hey, did I just see a flash? What was that? Is that lightning? But if you're not looking directly at it, it's like that, and you're just kind of like, did I just blink really fast? What was that? Right? If you're not paying attention, you may not even really realize it. You may be think, oh, maybe I'm just seeing things. Or maybe there wasn't anything. Right? But if you're paying attention, okay, maybe you noticed it. Right? That's probably why Jesus says to watch. Right? Watch. Pay attention. Stay alert. Stay alive. Right? So... This is not the second coming of the Lord, right? That's how he's going to be in his day before what's to happen, right? Because then he talks about what? Then it's going to be like in the days of Noah. He's not saying that the rapture happens right when it's the days of Noah. This lightning flashing, as I'm going to connect to Matthew 24, shows the rapture. Jesus taught it. You just have to pay attention. He says lightning flashing is in that moment, the twinkle of an eye. Immediately John is in the spirit. That's the rapture, my friends. And then it talks about us in the days of Noah. As you see, this is Enoch. This lightning flashing. He was there and he's gone. Where's Enoch? Nobody knows. It was like lightning. Gone. Here one day, gone the next. 
Like, what happened to him? Everybody looked for him, nothing. No sign of him. It doesn't say there's any sign of his clothes either. It doesn't say there was blood, just like he's gone. It doesn't say there's any trace of him or anything. So that's probably how the rapture is going to be. He's like, he's, where is he? Or like Elijah. He was taken up without dying to heaven too. And he was taken up in body and his clothes. So perhaps he was changed on the way up and there is nothing left. Like no garments fell, no blood, no body. All of it was changed, right? I don't know. That's That's the evidence we got from the scriptures, right? So it's the way we should probably look at it. Uh, but uh, some of the shirts I wear, I, I kind of hope when I'm taking up these shirts, fall down and people see it, right? So, because a lot of shirts I wear, like the one I'm wearing right now, says something about the rapture. So it'd be cool if they just see a, a pile of clothes and then a shirt that's on top says something about the rapture and then, oh, okay, I got to get straight with God, right? Hopefully that's where their mind goes anyway. Sorry for jumping all over the place. Uh, but uh, then it says, you know, their life is going to go on like it did, just like when Enoch left. So, oh, yeah, well, he was gone, and then they just went about their lives, right? And then it's likewise, it's like the days of Lot, right? Doing whatever they're doing, boom, Lot's gone, and then they're destroyed. You notice that the wrath of God is poured out after Lot's taken out. Lot didn't go through this destruction period and protected through everything. Right? He's taken out of it. And then it says about, oh, when you see this stuff, like know the signs of the times, get out of Dodge, right? Don't look back. You know, where it says, remember Lot's wife. Because it's basically telling you, don't look back to the world and everything you're missing out. You got to let it go. Right? This way of spiritual sacrifice, letting your former life go, you got to let it go, right? And it mentions how two doing this, two doing that, one's taken, one's left. And they say, where, Lord? He leaves this part out. Part out. Where are they taken? Well, where the body is, there will the eagles be gathered. So he's like, hey, up in the sky. He says it in a poetic, parable, metaphoric way. Where the eagles are is where they'll be gathered. Because where are we going to meet them? In the clouds. Kind of where the eagles like to hang out. When the... They see a body that they're going to go scavenge on. Not that they always scavenge, but they, they'll do that. Kind of like a vulture. Uh, but Matthew 24, it says this again. But you'll notice there's two different, I guess, in a sense, because it mentions here coming. But I never teach the rapture as the coming of the Lord. I teach it as a sign that he's about to come. Right. As we read here in Matthew 24, verse 26, it says, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in a secret chamber, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even out of the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagle, eagles be gathered together. That paragraph right there, verses 26 through 28, that's talking about the rapture. Right there, that lightning. Then it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So you see the order of events. Rapture, tribulation, then it goes on to say, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is different from lightning, right? Because he's... Coming on clouds, you see him coming. Lightning, if you weren't paying attention, you didn't really see it. This you see. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, one from end one end of heaven to the other. You see that last part there, they'll say, oh, that's the rapture. No. Because you see the clouds that Jesus comes on, this part is just lightning. But then when he returns... He's with the clouds. The clouds is actually not just like a cloud like you see in the sky. It's a cloud like a swarm, an army, like a cloud of bees or locusts. But it's the cloud of the armies of heaven, all of us with Jesus returning. As he returns with ten thousands of his saints, as Moses and Jude tell us. 
And apparently Jude says that Enoch says that as well. Uh, so uh, this part here, the elect, ha happens to be those Jews. You know how there's 144,000 of them all over the earth, and then there's all these Gentiles that have served God, and they're, they are living through this time. Well, the elect is going to gather them and bring them from one end of heaven to the other to Israel because he's going to establish his millennial kingdom. Right? So you can see the order of events here, and you see it clearly when you let the Bible explain itself and you compare the Bible to the Bible. And a lot of times, you need to get rid of the church traditions. And I think that's where I have a bit of advantage over a lot of Christians because a lot of Christians, they grew up in a church, in a denomination. So they have a lot of preconceived beliefs. They have a lot of traditions and they hold to them, right? And it's kind of ingrained in them. I did not grow up Christian. And this allows me to just look at it from an outside point of view and just focus on the Bible without any preconceived ideas or beliefs and without any traditions getting in the way. And I can just take God for what he says and not argue with him saying, well, that disagrees with the church. I'm following the church. Well, it doesn't line up with the traditions, right? And uh, I hope bringing this up allows people to accept that as well. But a lot of times, you know, the pride gets in the way. Like, this guy seems genuine, fairly humble, I guess. But then talking to him about something like this, you get to see the spirit there. Sometimes he doesn't really want to hear this, right? We'll, we'll find out his spirit because these kind of things, like I said, they reveal that where people, you, you think they believe the gospel, right? But like I was telling, saying in the beginning of the video, you believe the gospel, that contradicts some of your other beliefs. Right? Like these people who believe in some kind of mid-trib or post-trib uh, rapture. How does that make sense with the mark of the beast? It just doesn't line up because... And it's a different gospel being preached in this time by an angel flying through heaven. Well, you're not going by sight anymore. I mean, you're not going by faith anymore. My bad, I got it mixed up. You're not going by faith anymore. You're going by sight. The angel's there talking, saying, hey, this is the gospel. Right? And it's a different gospel than what's being preached by the Bible to the Christian church by Paul during this church age here. But, uh, yeah, he brings up with his, I guess, his fourth point. I already talked about his fifth point, which was my sixth point. Jesus didn't talk about this. I already brought that up, so we got that done with. So let's go to his fourth point. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, he says it doesn't talk about two comings, right? And again, he doesn't talk about how it never brings up having to deal with uh, a great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the beast and his mark. Doesn't mention any of that. Matter of fact, it just says, hey, yeah, I know you feel sad about some of your family and friends who are Christians that have died, but don't worry, God's going to raise them up. And those of us who are alive and remain when we, he comes, we, we're going to be going up with him, right? But not before them, right? So he doesn't say, hey, 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 all right, well, yeah, they're dead and gone and then what have you, but... Don't worry, after you go through all this hell and high water, uh, then they'll be raised up and you'll be raised up. He doesn't tell them about any of that. He says, those of us that are alive and remain. He doesn't say those of us that are alive and remain after hell and high water through the book of Revelation. He doesn't mention any of that because we don't have to worry about that. That's the wrath of God that Jesus took for us. So we don't have to go through what has already been taken on our behalf. At the cross. And uh, this is where I have the note about Revelation 14, which I brought up in the beginning of the video, so I don't have to bring that up about how a different gospel during this time. So, with all this being said, that is that. I, I responded to everything uh, that he made as points and a bunch of the what I saw as side points. I think I added a lot of detail and whatever else. Uh, but uh, the rest of the video is just the thing that I always add to my video at the end. Uh, so these video, this one is only about 45 minutes, but it's probably going to look over an hour because I add 
uh, like a minute or so in the beginning and then about another 10 15 minutes with the video i put at the end hopefully this fella checked the video he got through it and uh uh yeah lets me know where he thinks i'm wrong and i i hope he stops saying that it's a secret and what have you because uh everybody seems to know about it it's kind of weird and uh, so many people tell me that there isn't a rapture so they know about it and it seems like the problem is they don't believe it so anyway with that, that being said thanks for watching take care All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible, the Scriptures, are the written Word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying, it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written to search the scriptures, bring them up. They testify of me, right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble 
for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the spirit of God and God's spirit is life giving as we see in Genesis, bringing life to to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name. They're prophesying in his name. They're casting out devils in his name. They're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as... Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. 
right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness, he says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass. And all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian. You never listen to a thing I say because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake, feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? <laughs> didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Yeah. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Amen.